Okay, everyone. Happy Halloween. Um, I know that we don't have our uh, on our actual website where the Artine and Takeout Science uh, website is and where we have usually have the video embedded. It's not working right now, so um, or it's not embedding. So I'm going to give people just a minute to realize that and then click through to view the actual uh, YouTube link. And um, but as you know. On the RTNN website, we have uh, all the takeout science uh, every week listed. And there's a page for week 15 Halloween treats. That's what we're doing today while people are still joining in, hopefully. Uh, and there's a little form at the bottom where you can submit questions. Uh, but um, yeah. So happy Halloween. This is the first takeout science that uh, we've had since, uh, I think, well, we reinstated or reinitiated Takeout Science uh, on Nano Day, which was 10, 9, 10 to the 9th, October 9th. But I think the last actual like science lesson broadcast was uh, July when we did a photolithography activity. Uh, and we did, I think we talked about sunprint paper and some other things. But just to remind you, Takeout Science all started uh, when we, um, when Dr. Holly from Duke, who brought a scanning electron microscope home and was able to uh, bring some samples and teach you some science about different things. And so if you don't remember me, uh, I'm Philip Strader. I'm, I, I am basically what Dr. Holly is at Duke, but instead of at NC State, uh, I, I work in the anal analytical instrumentation facility uh, and where we have a little electron microscope and I have an optical microscope and we're gonna be going over some science on Halloween themed treats today. Uh, and I am dressed up in costume. Um, I'm not gonna reveal what I'm dressed up as until the end, so you have to pay attention. If you want to make any guesses, uh, put them in the form or email them to us. Uh, I will give you some hints. The hat is everything. Uh, now the logo is green, uh, and unfortunately I have a green screen behind me, so it's kind of moving in. And then I also have green fingerless gloves. Those are also a big part of it, okay? And they're also getting removed. And then even else not pictured is my green backpack, which is also being uh, removed because of the green screen. So imagine all the stuff that we'll see through just now was green. Um, and some of you 90s kids better get this um, if you're watching. So today we are looking at some neat samples that are all Halloween themed since we've got Halloween coming up on Saturday. So the sample stuff that I have in the electron microscope right now is uh, going to have some pumpkin parts. We've got the seed of a pumpkin, and we've got the skin of a pumpkin right here. And then we have some candy, and we have dark a, a chocolate chip. We have some sugar, different types of sugars, and a marshmallow. So we're going to be taking a quick look at those uh, with the microscope. We have an optical microscope. Well, Holly usually has an optical microscope with her right beside her, but my optical microscope is over there and I don't really have room for it. So what I did was I took pictures and we'll be comparing the pictures from the optical microscope and the electron microscope as we go along. All right. So the first thing we're going to look at is pumpkin. So I have a little cross section of my pumpkin right here. I'm going to make myself a little bit bigger for you. There, that'll look better. All right. So we're used to pumpkins, you know, that are bright and orange, and you know, we usually cut them open and make jack-o'-lanterns out of them. But today, I need to define a few parts of the pumpkin. We have the skin, which is the tough exterior. You see, it's got ridges and things like that. We have the stem. I believe this is called the blossom end. And then we have the internal cavity, and then this is the the actual flesh inside. Um, and then we have seeds and fibers and all kinds of what I think we just call those guts. Um, or at least that's what I've always called them. And this is what we remove when we want to make a little jack-o'-lantern. You know, when you carve it out and then you carve a face into the skin and then you put a candle in there. Um, and fun fact, uh, apparently pumpkins were not the first uh, item used to make jack-o'-lanterns. I don't know if they were always called jack-o'-lanterns. But actually... Irish or people from Ireland used to have a festival that was a precursor to Halloween, I think called Semine. Semine? I can't, I haven't actually looked up how it's pronounced, but, uh, and then when Irish immigrants moved over to the Americas, they brought their traditions with them, and initially they would carve out turnips. 
And so turnips were a lot smaller, but pumpkins are native to uh, the Americas. And so when they moved over here, they adapted the tradition to pumpkins. And so now we carve out pumpkins. I thought that was a really interesting uh, tidbit, but yeah. So today we're just gonna be looking at the pumpkin seed and the pumpkin skin. So on the left here, we have an optical image of the pumpkin seed. And then this is a picture I took of the entire seed. And then on the right is a similar uh, magnification image of the pumpkin skin. And uh, we'll start looking at those. Now we're gonna switch over to my SEM. And then, uh, yep, it looks like you can see everything that I'm seeing. And now I'm gonna turn on the electron microscope. Another fun fact while this is starting up is that uh, I did not know this before I started doing research for this. Uh, pumpkins are actually fruits. They're not vegetables because they actually come from a flowering plant. The way it actually grows is they uh, they obviously plant the seeds, I think, in June. And then the they, uh, a vine or a sprout comes out that turns into a vine and has flowers on it. And the pumpkins uh, will grow off of that. And actually the vines and the leaves that come off that, of that vine are very important for the pumpkins uh, because pumpkins are technically part of a broader family of fruits called uh, winter squash, which includes things like butternut and zucchini or butternut squash and zucchini. And pumpkin is not really a, uh, an official botanical term. It's just a very specific uh, version of winter squash that is orange. And the reason that it's orange is because they the pumpkins are staying under the leaves and not getting any sunlight. So, you know, when we see plants outside and leaves, you know, we see a lot of green and that's because of chlorophyll. Uh, plants are using sun and with other things to create food and they turn green because of chlorophyll. And so usually the uh, gourds would turn green colors and you could sometimes find those at pumpkin patches. But because these pumpkins have been under, uh, under the leaves and not getting sunlight, they don't get to produce chlorophyll and they stay a bright orange color. And that's what we like in our pumpkins. In fact, we only make, or I think we grow like 500 million pounds of pumpkins, which is those orange pumpkins per year. And we don't even eat them. They're all for decoration. So let's go look at that bright orange color, which we saw in the optical microscope, but not in the, uh, we will not see color in the SEM because electrons don't have color. But We'll go to about this magnification and start scanning really slowly. And now this is the pumpkin skin that I showed you on that first picture. And now remember it was orange, but we didn't see a lot of texture. And really we know that pumpkins are kind of bumpy, but uh, to me they look kind of smooth between those ridges. And so what I'm seeing here is a lot of cracks and things. Now, the reason I didn't just put every part of the pumpkin uh, into the microscope, and I don't wouldn't want to put a whole pumpkin in there, is because it does contain a lot of water. And so um, even though I only shaved, a you know, like taking a vegetable peeler, shaved a very small portion of this pumpkin and then put it in the microscope in our gold cutter, uh, that removes all the water. So I think what we're looking at really is that that skin is kind of cracked. And, and in fact, it was laying flat when I first put it on the, the, uh, the stub, but then as the water was being removed, it started curling up. Um, and so I think a lot of the cracks in what we're seeing are like that. Uh, and just because it was dehydrating. Let's try and zoom in a little bit and then scan even slower. So let's go back to fast and let's look at one of these. And while this picture is coming up, uh, I've learned a lot about pumpkins and, and squash over the past few days, especially last night. Uh, Whenever we think of something being pumpkin flavored, it's not actually pumpkin at all. These orange pumpkins have really not much flavor at all. So whenever you see canned pumpkin or other things like that in the store or even pumpkin spice, what it's really flavored is from other pumpkins that have less of a bright orange color. And they, uh, the, more, or the more green it is or even more tan colors, they have more of a flavor to them. And so that's what they actually make canned pumpkin puree out of. Even though they have an orange pumpkin on the can, it's not actually orange pumpkin. And pumpkin spice may have some squash flavor with some uh, um, like cinnamon, nutmeg, and some other flavors in it. All right, so the, the pumpkin uh, skin was pretty cool to look at. And I'm gonna switch over to the seed now, but I do wanna go back and look at a higher res image that I took with the optical microscope. Now, 
Dr. Holly has an optical microscope that takes uh, some good pictures, but my optical microscope takes good pictures and can give us three-dimensional information of whatever we're looking at. So this is a very high resolution image on that microscope of the pumpkin skin before going under vacuum or anything. And we see all these bumps on it and it looks like it's got different depth of bumps on it. Um, and so I can basically create a 3D model of it. So it's interesting that we couldn't really see this texture uh, when we when we have it in the electron microscope, we just see cracks and things like that. But so maybe this texture goes away when we put it under an electron microscope. So if you don't remember, um, when we put things under an electron microscope or under, it has to go under vacuum. And so when we put it under vacuum, it removes all of the water. So sometimes the, the features that we see may change because water has been removed. All right, so now we're on the pumpkin seed and this is just the, the outside of the pumpkin uh, seed. So just as we saw it in the optical image and gonna refocus and rebright and change the brightness. And now we're gonna start scanning slow and then see what we see. See, I don't really like that focus. I think I can do a, a little bit of a better job. Let's try it again. There we go. All right, now let's scan slow and see what that looks like. All right, so that's a much better picture. And so even though we know, so I've, when I showed the pumpkin earlier, we had a lot of fibers in it. Um, I did put fibers on the stub, but it's uh, the stub that I put in just a little bit too big, so it's off the screen, but the the fibers in the pumpkin, the best I can tell, are really there to hold the seeds and kind of secure them. And I think the seeds kind of grow off of the fibers. I may not be totally wrong. So anyways, the point is there are fibers on the seed. And that's what those little pumpkin guts or the, the orange stuff, the orange fibers, that's what this is. And then I think, I'm pretty sure we saw this almost like honeycomb geometric pattern in the optical image of the pumpkin seed. So it doesn't look as good in the optical microscope because... Uh, there's not a lot of color difference on that texture, but it really shows up in the electron microscope. I think that's very cool. Now, we uh, this is not the first time we're looking at seeds on Takeout Science. Uh, I believe we looked at it, actually the first time I was ever a, a host on Takeout Science, I was looking at a flax seed that a user sent in, and I think I have the episode written down here somewhere. Uh, let's see. Yeah, week 12 is when we looked at a flax seed, and we went over a little bit about the parts, and um, I'm only going to mention just a few parts of the of this pumpkin seed as we go through. Right now we're looking at the seed coat. So in any seed, you have the inside, which has an embryo, which is what grows into the next plant, and you have a lot of storage for food. And so the outside is meant to just be a, a, a protective layer for it, so it's got to be very tough and very thick. And even though I mentioned earlier, we don't... Uh, usually eat the orange pumpkins. I have a lot of memories of actually eating these um, these pumpkin seeds. You can take them out and clean off the fibers and then you can season them a little bit and then toast them and they taste really nice. But uh, I do remember that the seeds themselves, the seed coat is pretty rough. Um, and I, I found some papers yesterday uh, or studies where people are trying to figure out like you know you can you can take off the seed coat or you can do a, a process called maceration where it makes it a little bit softer when you before you cook it um, but either way for the seed itself uh, it's got to be tough now let's I want to go drive a little bit to the left and we'll zoom in some here and then focus and I'll while it's focusing I'm going to pull up what we're going to be looking at here is, if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing at kind of where the this very narrow part of the seed is. This is what we're going to be looking at here in just a second. So we've refocused, and I want to actually refocus again, and then adjust brightness. All right, now we'll zoom out, and let's look at it at low mag and do low magnification and slow it down. So while that's acquiring, I'm gonna point out a couple more things about this layout here. Um, I kinda of just jumped in and started showing you pictures and I'm gonna zoom around so uh, don't mind me if I get a little bit queasy. Right here is our magnification bar. So that tells us how much bigger what we're looking at over here is than real life. So this image is 80 times bigger than what it is uh, 
if we were to look at with our own eyes. Down here on the data bar, and I'm sorry, I can't really put my whole arm up. I can do this. Uh, this is the scale bar. So from this dash to this dash, that distance is 500 microns, which is about half a millimeter. So think about on a on a on a on a like a yardstick or or some uh, measurement tool you have in your house. The smallest unit's usually a millimeter. So this distance is about half of that. So that's very small. Those fibers that are in the pumpkin, which are attached right here, uh, can be very small. And uh, especially when they're dehydrated, they're very wet when we're pulling them out of the pumpkin ourselves. But I believe this is where the plant would actually grow out of. So this may be some type of nutrient uh, system for the, for the embryo. I can't be totally sure. I'm not a pumpkin seed expert. So now let's go over to Similar to what I did in week 12, I cut the seed in half and then I set it upright so that we could see the inside of the seed. Now, it, you have to be very careful when you are doing what's called cross-sectioning of, of anything you want to see on the inside because if you just use scissors or even just a razor blade and just cut it in half, uh, it can cause a lot of damage to that uh, while, during the cutting process. So we'll keep that in mind. There are better pictures online of some of the things that I'm about to show you. Um, but I did my best job with the time I had and I think it still turned out great. So let's get the auto contrast good and now scanning slower. So imagine if I took one of these seeds and I'm spilling seeds everywhere and I just cut it in half and then I stuck it up on its side and that's what we're looking at right now. And that's what we call in microscopy, a cross-section. We're not looking at the surface, we're looking at the inside. And so from week 12, I totally encourage you to go look at that episode again, um, but I'll recap that we, that on the inside of the, uh, of the seed, you have all the food storage and the embryo that will actually become a plant later and feed that plant through its uh, germination process. And so what we're looking at is a lot of food storage and, and pumpkin seeds, I think are almost half fat and oil. And so they do make pumpkin oil out of some of these, uh, seeds. And so what we're probably looking at is a lot of proteins, fats, or oily stuff that, um, has kind of, uh, emulsified throughout all the time that it's just been sitting around and we can still see the outer coat, which is meant to protect it. So that's what the outer side is. And I've always noticed that the inside of a seed always has this like gap in it. And I'm not sure exactly what that is, but let's go up to the top here. And then again, I again think this is like the part of the seed that we were just looking at at the end where it's very narrow. And let's uh, try and go uh, do a slow scan here. So now I'm starting to see a little bit more texture uh, kind of at this top part. and. I'm starting to see more features and kind of circles and things like that. And I had no clue what I was looking at uh, the first time I put this in. And after we let this image acquire a little bit, um, we'll go in and look more at, that, at those things. But I think we're out of the food storage area. And we can also see kind of, you can see those lines that were the texture of the seed coat before. So we know that that's the seed coat. And so what it looks like is there's, and what I found out is that there are a ton of different sublayers of a pumpkin seed. And uh, there are some researchers out there that have gone through a lot of trouble trying to measure these and define these different layers on a seed coat. So even though I'm uh, only pointing out a few parts, you know, outer coat inside and the food storage and the embryo, uh, there's so many different sublayers to this. And the one that sticks out to me is it is this area so let's go back to fast scanning so I can see what I'm doing and then we're gonna kind of zoom in here let's do an autofocus again all right so I was just really I don't know I thought this was such a beautiful part of the sample uh, it almost looks like coral to me or some type of sea life uh, you know we have these like crazy holes and patterns and and uh, and I didn't use this word to describe it until I think I found out what it is. But what I believe this is called is called parenchyma. P-A-R-Y-N-C-H-E-M-A. I think I spelled it right. Um, and this can either serve as more food storage for the plant 
or it can be, uh, or it can actually be just for more structural integrity, or it can be both. But um, there are two types of parenchyma. There is, uh, I think it's perpendicular or linear parenchyma, which is more straight lines. And this one, I believe, is what's called spongy parenchyma. And so the word that I wouldn't have thought to describe it as first, but after I heard it or read it, totally made sense. It looks like kind of spongy. It looks like what a sponge looks like, where you have holes in a network of, of different things. And I swear yesterday, I saw a face somewhere in here, and I'm going to try to find that face again because it was kind of spooky. Spooky, I mean. I'm sure if we sit here and look enough, we'll find a face again, but we won't spend too much time. But this was a pleasant surprise. I wasn't expecting to see anything like this um, when I put this sample in. I see a few different faces around, maybe like this. I see some eyes. It's like a two eyes and it's someone that's like going, whoa. All right, I'll stop embarrassing myself. We'll go back to fast scanning. And so that's everything for the pumpkin seed. Uh, there are so many different parts. And uh, um, if anyone's interested in learning more about the different subparts, I can send you uh, the document and article that I was reading. It's a little heavy handed uh, if you're only in high school or younger, but I'd be happy to share it with you if you want to see it. So now we're going to move on to candy and bef and we know why we love candy and that's because candy is sweet. So what I actually wanted to do quickly is look at some sugar. Now we've looked at sugar before. Dr. Holly has looked at sugar before and she was looking at white, I think regular table sugar. I, I think the episode she was making, yeah, it was week five titled What's Cooking? And so she was baking uh, peanut butter cookies with June the Science Doc. And so one of her ingredients was sugar, and she talked a little bit about crystals and things like that. Um, but I want to show you two different types of sugar today and kind of note how big they are as we start looking at these treats that, were, that are specific to Halloween, at least to me. So on the right here, we have just regular white table sugar. And on the left here is what's called turbinado sugar, or it could just be called brown sugar, but specifically it's called turbinado. Now the first difference is color. On the right, the, the, the white sugar is kind of crystal clear and it looks white to us if we look at it, if we spill it on the table, or if it's in a container. And on the left, the turbinado sugar is a little bit more brown. So the key difference here is color. And that's because on the left here, turbinado sugar has a little bit more molasses content from the, the production process. And so if you're not aware of what molasses is, uh, it's this brown syrupy liquid. Um, and because it still has that content in this from the, from the production process, uh, it's just a little less processed. So they didn't try to take it out and make it pure and refined like on the right. The other difference that I see here, so we see this scale bar here. Again, that's a 500 micron scale bar. That's about half millimeter. So we can assume that these images are roughly the same in scale. And the turbinado sugar is much more bigger than the clear sugar. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at some crystal sizes uh, as we look through these candies. But uh, go ahead and look at those difference. So the the, so on the left here is a little less refined, and then on the right it's more refined. So as you refine and refine something, you get rid of impurities, uh, and you can also decrease the size. So there's more processing involved to get into these smaller sizes. I personally prefer turbinado sugar, especially in my coffee in the morning. It has a little bit more of a syrupy taste. Uh, I can tell a difference. I do prefer turbinado sugar in my coffee. All right, so now let's go back to the SEM. And right now we're looking at the white sugar. And I'm gonna zoom in and we're gonna focus and then do an auto brightness because it's gonna be a little bit darker over here. And now we're, let's zoom out to about the same magnification we were at with the uh, optical microscope image we were just looking. So that scale bar, sorry, I'm flipped, is still about 500 microns, so 0.5 millimeters. And to me, it's a little bit bigger, so it's probably a slightly higher magnification, um, and we have a lot more uh, sugar crystals here. So this probably looks familiar if you were looking, if you were with Dr. Holly when in the What's Cooking episode. 
it's just crazy how these uh, shapes look like uh, even under an SEM. You know, they have these very, very sharp angular uh, features and they look like crystals. And we see a lot of crystals in nanotechnology. Uh, and what's, if you zoom in even more, you can even see smaller crystals. Not a great focus. We will refocus and then start scanning slow. And then even on the surface, we have some smaller particles and crystals. But generally speaking, uh, we're mostly going to see the big ones when, uh, when we're looking at it or cooking with it. But there can be these smaller facets or different uh, parts of the crystal um, on it. So Holly has some great images of white sugar uh, as well. Now let's go look at the turbinado sugar. And as we move over, kind of think about how many crystals you saw in a single area on that one. And as I move over to the turbinado sugar, now I have it a little bit less dispersed because I didn't have as much with me. Um, but still, I think you'll notice a difference in the size. All right, so let's get back to the same magnification. What was it, 80? All right, we're back at 80 magnification. Let's go up to this one. I think I'm running out of room on my microscope. So yeah, my sample stub is too big. Um, and I didn't think about that for today's uh, lesson. So I, there are some parts of my stub that I can't actually navigate to. Oops. All right, so now we're scanning slow. Again, at the same magnification that we were just looking at the white sugar. And we are seeing only about two grains of that sugar. Now, a little bit of that is my fault because I didn't have as much of this sugar. But still, imagine if the screen was full of particles at the same magnification. We're only seeing two in what we call our field of view right now, which is the whole area. So. The turbinado crystals are much larger, and so there's a lot more refinement to get to get that sugar in to be smaller crystals and have less impurities. We'll go and zoom in a little bit more. Refocus. And then we will kind of just look at the surface quickly. Now, as this image is acquiring and we're looking at the surface of the turbinado sugar, the brown sugar, um, think about the size of those. And I wouldn't recommend it, but imagine if you were to take a spoonful of the sugar and then eat it. It would be very gritty and very crunchy, right? They're, these crystals are hard and they're large. It'd be, you know, if you've ever gone, that I think, in the mountains where they make rock candy or you can find rock candy in stores, those are massive crystals. And... You know, in some candies, we like them to be crunchy like that, but these are very hard, and even though they're sweet, it would be very hard to eat. So what we know about some candy is it's chewy and it's soft. And uh, so what I'm getting at here is that crystal size is going to be very important when we're looking at the next candy. So think about the size, and I'll try to keep the magnification as we go to the next, uh, to the actual candy, and... We will uh, and think about that in terms of the magnification when we get to the next one. So now we're going to move over to candy corn. Or actually, no, let's do chocolate first. And while it's moving over there, I will pull up optical microscope image. So this is just a single chocolate chip, like you would find in a chocolate chip cookie, or you'd find a bag of these chocolate chips in uh, the grocery aisle in the baked section. I do have one right here, very small. And on the left here, I just have an overview picture that I stitched together. And then I have a kind of higher or an actual like optical microscope image of the top down. So we know that chocolate chips have kind of like the curly cue at the top. And in fact, Hershey Kisses, if you've ever seen those are basically the same thing, just made a little bit bigger. And so we're looking kind of top down at the peak of that mountain. Um, and now we're looking at the chocolate chip in the microscope, in the electron microscope, and I'm going to refocus. And we're going to zoom out just a little bit and then start scanning slowly. So in any chocolate, um, 
your main ingredients are going to be cocoa butter, which comes from uh, expression from a cacao plant, or the actual fruit of a cacao plant. And they're going to press it and extract the butter out of it, and then they're going to add a bunch of sugar and some other stuff. Now, this chocolate chip is actually dark chocolate, which is my preference. Uh, it's a little bit more bitter and uh, a little bit more uh, brittle, which means harder to break, and a little less creamy. Now, I like that. Milk chocolate, which is what the traditional Hershey's bar is, uh, they add milk powder to it, which makes it a little bit more creamy. So uh, we probably won't see a milk powder, but what we will see is the, the difference in the cacao butter and and maybe the sugar crystals. So let's zoom in a little bit here. Let's refocus. And then let's try right there. So I'm starting to see little globules. They kind of we when we say globules, G L O B U L E S, think of the word globe. So they think of like, you know, the 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 shape of the earth is a globe and we see some of these globules coming around and then there might be some more even crystalline shapes in there which is probably the sugar. So wherever you see something globular, that's more of the butter and then there is uh and whenever you see something crystalline, that would be the sugar. So think about the shapes we were just seeing. Now we won't see a lot of sugar in dark chocolate because this is actually semi-sweet, so it's not as sweet, has less chocolate in it. But um, I will post a link to uh, John Hopkins did a little online class and they have SEM images of milk chocolate online. So I would encourage you to look at, think of what you saw in this picture and then go compare it to, to what they see and see if you uh, find more crystals. Another thing that I'm gonna point out on the chocolate is kind of how I see kind of these light and dark areas. Let's see if I can move a little bit over here where you can see more of that. And we'll start scanning slow. So with all of these samples, and we may have talked about this quite a long time ago, uh, I have to coat them with something conductive to make them work and actually get an image out of them in an, in an electron microscope. So when uh, basically the electron microscope works on the basis of how electricity works, it's the transfer of electrons. So we're shooting electrons at a sample we're, and we're ejecting electrons from, uh, from that sample and we're counting them as they come off. And the more conductive, the more conducive to electricity a material is, the easier it is to image with an electron microscope. So if we can't, if something is not conductive, it's insulating, it wants to hold on to electrons, then we have to make it conductive somehow. And the way we do that is by we coat just a little bit of metal on it, usually gold. So all of these are golden chocolate chips or golden marshmallows. It's not a lot of gold. And that helps us image uh, the sample. Now, in that process, we're creating a plasma, which is really hot. Basically, it gets really hot. And unfortunately, chocolate is you know going to melt very easily so that heat is enough to make it start melting and so what this texture that we really see is mostly from that melting process i had to take a very long time to to coat it for a little bit and then stop coating and then coat it again but even then it gets soft and then kind of falls apart uh or just kind of re uh restructures itself uh, as it's melting and then reforms so those big textures are definitely the cocoa butter or the fats uh kind of just that got softened up and then uh, reformed, but the sugar would not be melting as easily. So what I think is the brighter areas is kind of where it didn't melt as much, and then these ridges would be where it melted some. I don't think I noticed this crack yesterday. Let's Let's just see if we can see in there very quickly. So the way they actually make uh, chocolate chips is they basically mix all the ingredients and they have it uh, a little hot or warm where it's you know molten and then they have it set to a temperature where they basically just drop the chocolate on the trays and then they drop that mixture and it forms the chips the the way that it looks like just by the viscosity of it when, and I use that word viscosity uh, that means basically how fluid something is so if it's if 
if you think of something like water, that's more viscous. It's gonna it's gonna spread out more. Um, and so chocolate, there's a there's a good amount of viscosity that helps it hold its shape, but then also create the shape that we uh, that we love. Because if we just pour too hot chocolate, it would just spread out everywhere. So it has to be just the right temperature when they drop it to get that shape. And there is a video that um, I will hopefully post online where we can look at all of those. All right, so now let's go look at candy corn. Now we all know candy corn. It's candy in the shape of corn. And now if we go look at the optical microscope image. So this is a stitched image that I made of an entire candy corn. You know, we traditionally, it looks like this. It's, it's yellow and then it's got orange in the middle and then white at the top. And I took a little microscope image of the yellow area and um, I didn't expect it to look this rough. Uh, at least I had never actually looked at it before. Um, and that's what it looks like in an optical microscope. So let's go look at it in the SEM. And so since we started on the yellow, I actually can't reach the yellow. So we're going to start on the white. All right, so we've refocused. And now we're going to adjust the contrast. Let's go back out a little bit and then start scanning slow. So we're seeing about the same texture as what we saw just before, but a little bit more detail. It looks more rockier to me. Before it just looked kind of rough and had, you know, texture to it. But now we're starting to see a little bit more uh, pieces and bits and stuff in there. And so the way they make candy corn is they basically make a mixture of sugar, uh, corn syrup, salt, and other things, uh, but the main flavor in marshmallow er, in candy corn is actually marshmallow. So they make a marshmallow cream, and that's the actual flavor of candy corn. And so they mix all that stuff together, and then with the dyes, they have a corn-shaped mold that they inject, basically drop the white mixture in, and then the orange mixture in, and then the yellow mixture in, and then they let it cool, and then they can eject it later, and then. Uh, after it's uh, solidified, uh, they can take it out. And at that point, it's still sticky. And so what they do is they then put all the candy corns into this little, like, it almost looks like a dryer. And it's like a, a rotating drum. And then they pour glaze on it, which is going to form a hard outer shell to it. So a lot of the problem with candy, like if I was trying to hold chocolate in my hand, right, it would melt. But with some candies, they do this. They make, they put some type of glaze or coating on it so that it doesn't get sticky. Or, or stick together in the packaging or melt in your hands. You know, M&Ms, the, the chocolate, the little round candies that are covered in candy chocolate or candy and then chocolate in the center. We should all know what M&Ms are. Uh, their, their original like saying, I think, was melt in your mouth, not in your hand. So that's the same technology. They use that on a lot of different candies. And that's mostly what we're looking at right now is that outer exterior. But we can still kind of see some shapes in there. So let's zoom in just a little bit. Now, remember again, the the massive size of the crystals that we're looking at in the regular table sugar and the turbinado sugar. And we were just at a magnification that was similar to what we were looking at there. And it's so much harder to see those crystals right here, but they're there. They're these tiny little crystals. And these globules may be also gelatin or or other things that they use, but the, the very bright, sharp things, those are the crystals. Now, to make marshmallow fluff, which is the, the flavor ingredient that goes into candy corn, you have to have a very, very smooth uh, cream consistency. And to get that smooth cream consistency, you need very, very fine crystals. So if you went to a baking section, you would see different types of sugar. You might see granulated sugar, which is kind of like what we just saw. Well, it's regular table sugar, but then you might see powder sugar or granulated sugar, which I think is a little bit smaller than table sugar. And so all of those are different sizes. And when you're baking something like candy, those crystal sizes are critically important to, to get the consistency or the flavor profile or, or the mouth feel, how it feels when you eat it. You know, if it's chewy, like we know candy corn is, uh, you need smaller crystals so it's not crunchy. You know, we don't want our, well, supposedly we don't want our candy corn to be crunchy and and, and hurt to eat. So to make that consistency, we have to have small crystals. So that's why they're much smaller when we're looking at them at higher magnification. 
And this concept isn't alien to us in nanotechnology and science. You know, if we want to make materials or objects smaller, we have to think about the crystal size of what we're using. And so when we're making devices or things, we want to have the smallest crystal size possible so that we can make a good thin film or, or processor or metal layer or anti-corrosion layer, that kind of thing. And uh, so to me, it's just crazy how everything's uh, kind of related. So I'm always intrigued when I'm reading through uh, things that I don't know about. And I'm like, well, wait, this sounds familiar. Crystal size, we need small crystals. So now what I'm looking at, and I'll press slow, and right now we're looking at kind of the area between the white and the orange uh, layer. So this line kind of right here would be on the right here we have white, and on the left side we have orange. Of course, we don't see color. Electrons don't have color. We see color because of a difference in light, which has a difference in wavelength. Uh, but electrons don't have differences in wavelength, so it's all black and white or grayscale. But what I wanted to point out is I have always kind of, when I did eat candy corn, uh, and I unfortunately still haven't eaten any of the bag that I brought, uh, I would always eat one layer at a time, and I would eat, you know, I would bite the white one off, and now I know why it was always so easy to get the white one off, because it looks like there's like, they don't get a great uh, bond between the different layers. Uh, so there might be some separation, and that's why it's easy to break off. I thought that was interesting. Um, materials are the same way. If you have any any indentation or fracture uh, between layers, that's where it's going to break. So it's crazy how much material science there is in all of this. But now let's go over to marshmallow, and I'll actually explain why I even wanted to use marshmallow. Obviously, it's because candy corn uh, is marshmallow flavored, but I have a confession. I never really liked candy corn. I didn't think it was that delicious, and I even thought the different flavors, you know, like the different colors had different flavors. Uh, but what I did love was the little candy pumpkins. And apparently those are the exact same thing. It's the exact same mix. They just use a different mold to uh, create a different shape. And so I felt silly, you know, this, I also didn't learn this just now, but a long time ago, I felt silly because apparently those pumpkins are the same flavor. They're called mellow cream uh, pumpkins, which is short for marshmallow cream pumpkins. And so it's still marshmallow cream in the candy corn. So I was duped and bamboozled. And, uh, and yeah, I felt silly. So I figured we'd look at marshmallow since we have marshmallow as a key ingredient in the... Um, the candy corn and the marshmallow pumpkins. And think about marshmallow and what uh, you know about marshmallows, right? They're, they're light, they're kind of fluffy, and I've always thought they were kind of squishy. And right now we're looking at, actually no, we're looking at the inside. I want to look at the surface real quick. So this would be the outside of the marshmallow, and we know that it's kind of squishy. Now let's look at it in the optical microscope, even though there's not much to see with the optical microscope. This one got a little bit dirty. There's some stuff on it from the glass slide that I put it on. I did not use a brand new glass slide for looking at it. But this is just the image in the optical microscope, and it's not too revealing to me. I mean, it's white and it looks fluffy. Um, let's go zoom in and then refocus. And while it's focusing, I'll then back out about to the same magnification that we were at for the sugar, and then let's start scanning slow. So I looked up some history on marshmallows, and if I'm deviating from science too much and talking about history, I'm sorry, but I always think it's very interesting to look at the history of things. So apparently the word marshmallow comes from 4,000 years ago, the Egyptians would make a, 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 a basically a medicinal, almost candy, I don't know, not really a candy, but it was like a lozenge for out of the mallow plant, which mallow is an actual plant which grows in very damp areas like a marsh. So there's a specific flower called the marshmallow, and they would take the root and then kind of boil it up with other things and with honey, and they would just reach this thick consistency, and it was this rich treat, and they would also use it for medicine, and it was supposedly only reserved for the gods and royalty. So... It probably didn't look a lot like what we know of marshmallow today. Apparently, 
French candy makers in the 1800s made something a little bit more like what the marshmallows were used to today, where they would still take the mallow root and then mix it with other things uh, to make a more fluffy type uh, mixture. And they would still kind of sell it as candy slash medicine. Now, modern marshmallows, I'm sorry to say, are not from the mallow plant and they are not medicine. So you can't go eat a ton of marshmallows, tell your parents that you were eating a bunch of candy or medicine and it's healthy. Uh, now, the marshmallows are made through by making a mixture of like sugar, gelatin, and some other things, and a lot of air. They have to whip a lot of air into the mixture so that it expands when they extrude it, and then it creates a kind of edible foam. That's basically what it is. Or And uh, then they chop it up into different pieces, or they turn them into duck-shaped pieces, like if you like peeps or bunny-shaped pieces. Those are marshmallow, too. Um, and then they sell it as marshmallow. So that was a lot of interesting history that I was reading up about the marshmallow last night. So I never knew that when I was saying uh, marshmallow, I was actually referring to a plant. It's crazy to me. So anyways, we're zooming in a little bit more. And before we saw kind of like these cracks and crevices, and to me it also, it almost looks like a, a, like a lunar surface. It looks like a, an, an alien planet ready to be uh, explored. But now that we're zooming in a little bit more, we're seeing more of the sugar crystals that make up the the marshmallow. So again, a key uh, point in making marshmallow is that they need very, very fine crystals to make a very smooth cream. So they need very, very small sugar to be able to create a foam. And that's what we're looking at, these tiny crystals. I mean, these are much smaller than than the sugar we were looking at. And that's a key, that's that's really important in, in making a smooth cream that they can then whip air into and then let it expand uh, and um, and then form into marshmallows like we know them today. And it's the same thing that goes into the uh, candy corn, but they add that glaze on top. Um, so yeah, um, that's very cool. I think this concludes everything that I really have to show to you. Um, and I also found when I was looking through all these candy making processes, my background is all in textiles. So there's a lot of polymer chemistry. I'll let it kind of slow down and let you look at the marshmallow surface again. Um, my background's all kind of in polymer chemistry and extrusion. So we make plastics kind of the same way. We make our mix of plastics, we get it to just the right temperature, and then we extrude it in whatever shape we want. In textiles, it's usually a fiber, or uh, you can make polymer uh, any polymers in almost any shape. Think of all the plastics. If you have toys, they, they get it to the right consistency and then they inject it into a mold of a truck or, or whatever toy you would want to use. And we use the same thing in nanotechnology. You know, it's it, we think about how you make microfluidic devices. You don't have to go look that up, but basically they're just these tiny little devices where we create a master mold of what we want the final product to look like. And then we take a cheaper material and then we inject it into that. And then we pull it out and now we have a device that we can make multiple copies of and, and, and use as nanotechnology. So it was just crazy to me reading through all the, all the ways they make this food and how it relates to materials chemistry or material science and, and, and like viscosity and crystal size, that kind of stuff, and also just manufacturing and, and how we make things. So big props to all the, all the food scientists out there that, that uh, can do all this. Now, I do want to also point out, you know, this looks a little bit rough. You know, to me, the the surface of a of a marshmallow is actually kind of soft and looks like a pillow, and this looks a little bit harder. And I think again, as we're as I was coating this, it probably got very hot and may have dehydrated the marshmallow a little bit more. The gelatin in the marshmallow supposedly binds to water, so we probably are dehydrating it a little bit um, as we coat it and put it in a vacuum environment. So. That may be why it doesn't look like this when we look at it in an optical microscope at the same magnification. So always interesting to look at stuff like that. Okay, that concludes Take Out Science, week 15, Halloween treats. Um, make sure you check out our website. I don't think we have a Take Out Science schedule, but I have some ideas for the next topics. Feel free to always email us, uh, rtnanonetwork at ncsu.edu. I will pull that up in a second. And let us know if there are ideas or if you want us to... to connect direct to a classroom and talk about a specific topic or look at samples that you want to look at that fall into your lesson. Otherwise, follow our, our go 
check out our Takeout Science webpage and make sure, see if there's when new, um, well, let me back out here. Yeah, so we will always add the next um, the next topic here or the next episode here. Again, let us know if you have any ideas. Um, and I have to reveal what my costume is. So I am Ash Ketchum from Pokemon. So I'm a big fan. I'm a big nerd of a few things. But I loved Pokemon cards and the Pokemon show when I was a kid. And I'm not ashamed to say I still like Pokemon cards. And so I am Ash Ketchum this year. I have my Pokeball. I have his hat. I have his green bag. And I have a few science helpers today. We usually have a science dog helping out. And I went all out with my costume this year. And I'd have to turn off the green screen. Bulbasaur and Squirtle are getting removed. And then we also have Charmander and Pikachu. So those were all Ash Ketchum's starting Pokemon in the show. And I've got them all here with me. And they're helping me do science. All right. So if you got it right, email us. Let us know. Um, I'll give you points if you even know what Pokemon is and, and knew anything about what I was talking about. Okay. That ends our Takeout Science. And we will see you next time.